Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson Jr. Today, Pastor Pearson's message is entitled Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. I want you to turn with me tonight to the book of James. For all of you uh, who may not be completely familiar with the book of James, you can find Hebrews. If you can find Hebrews, slowly go to the end of Hebrews. Slowly, because James is not a big chapter, not a big book. But find James, and I want to ask you to go to James chapter 1. And uh, you'll find out that I'm not faking with my title. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Well, let's see if there's anything in the Bible about that. James chapter 1. Let me start reading with verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you see it? It's a mirror in the Bible. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we open the word of God tonight, but we do so only with the assurance that the presence of God is anywhere that two or three are gathered in his name. So tonight we, we are grateful for the presence of divinity. Now we open this book hoping and believing that the power of God will come to be with us. Tonight we want to experience the power. And so we ask you to be with us. And we trust that it shall be so in the name of Jesus amen the Bible says that uh, uh, you uh, come to the mirror and if you are a faithful person when you look into the mirror you will see what you need and do something about it there are people however the text suggests who look at themselves and don't do anything they just walk away I must confess to you that at a certain age, looking in the mirror becomes a traumatizing experience. I confess that I have reached that age. I read years ago that after you pass 32, you always remember yourself as what you look like at 32. Can you imagine what happens when I look in a mirror? I see my dad. I see my mom, I see some horrible guy who needs to turn himself in for an extreme makeover, but I'm shocked that it's me. And the fact is that the mirror doesn't do anything about what I look like. In fact, if the mirror says you look wrinkled, as it often does, uh, I really don't have the nerve for plastic surgery, so I got to live with these wrinkles. What I try to do is smile a lot and get cute wrinkles, because mine are going to stay. But the fact is that the mirror does not have the power to do anything about what you look like. In fact, if you ever look in your mirror, and your mirror reaches out to wash your face, it may be time to move. Huh? Now, I, I, uh, I started a metaphor the other night, and I was talking about choirs. I got a pastor in trouble. I got a call. A pastor called me and said, look, you have gotten me in trouble. I got three choirs in my church. None of them had robes. And then the other night said, you, you said you can't take a choir seriously until they have robes. He said, now our church has to raise money to get three choirs, choir robes. And I apologized to him. But here is what my metaphor was meant to say the problem with people who claim to be gods is that they can't be taken seriously until they resemble each other eh? if you claim Jesus and you act a certain way 
And I claim Jesus, but I am nothing near what you are. Somebody has got a problem. Until we resemble each other. And you remember we read it the other night. When I am born into the new family, then I begin to try to resemble my new father in everything that I do. And here's what happens. If I resemble my new father and you resemble your new father, you and I will tend to resemble each other. Oh, that was the weakest amen I've heard yet. The, the, the fact is that if you are in Christ and I'm in Christ, we're family. So you might as well like me. And one of the ways you can show you like me is to say amen in this audience. It works here. <laughs> so we are family because we are in Christ. I want to suggest to you tonight that one of the biggest problems with the family of God is that the people who claim to be like Christ don't resemble him enough and I want to tell you why because they don't look in the mirror <laughs> the, the Bible says that the mirror is the law now I, I, I know why you're getting quiet a little nerve, nervous time if there is no law there is no mirror I don't know what I look like so when I see you I don't know whether I look like you or not because I didn't see myself and what you got to do in fact I, I, as I look at you I have no doubt in my mind that every one of you checked the mirror before you came now uh, sometimes a mirror can't help when you dress hurriedly <clears throat> I'm gonna look away from you when I say that because Somebody may be in here with stuff that doesn't match and I don't want you to think I'm picking on you You know that you, you need to check the mirror before you leave. I have had that experience I, I went out one time my wife had not done her final check on me gentlemen. Can you relate? <laughs> Until she says it's right. I really ought not leave but you know sometimes you got to dress without your wife being there and you got on a black suit and blue socks and you don't know it until you get in the light and then you're going to try to but the fact is that without a mirror we don't have any way to know I'm going to I'm going to cut to the chase for a moment and show you that the biggest problem with modern Christians is that we don't resemble each other enough and we don't resemble each other enough because somebody misunderstood the word of God and threw the mirror away are you still with me and you and I know that the mirror in this sense represents the law because the Bible says that the law is like a mirror and you know what's so wonderful about the the law as a mirror it doesn't really care who you are when you look in it it'll tell you the truth there's somebody here tonight who's got enough money to buy and sell me before breakfast. But when you look into law, it doesn't care. It'll say, you need to change. You've got a problem and you need to correct it. When the former president of the United States looked into the mirror of the law, it never changed what it said because of his office. Because the law tells everybody the truth. Huh? So there was no political clout that could change it. The law is not politically correct. It does not say, oh, well, you don't look good, but you're okay because I know who you are. I know who your relatives are. Let me tell you something. When you look in this book, the Bible is like a two-edged sword, it says of itself. And it'll cut preachers. In fact, I, sometimes I preach sermons and I'll have people say rather jokingly, Pastor, you were stepping all on my toes today. What they mean was I got something they didn't want to particularly hear. And I'll tell them, before I stepped on your toes, this thing stepped on mine. Because while I was getting ready to bring it to you, it was getting me ready for the process. So I want to suggest that, that somebody got confused and threw away the law. Would you go to the book of Colossians? Now, let me give you a hint tonight. If you don't do well moving in the Bible, 
Stick close to Romans. I've got Romans texts tonight, but this is Colossians. And I'm going <laughs> to, I'm starting now to do cut to the chase preaching. I've learned that we are living in a cut to the chase generation. You don't want me to play around and amble all over the thing and, and uh, be mealy mouth or namby pamby. You want me to tell it like it is. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Got a text here that a lot of folk misunderstand. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. And here's a text that is often misunderstood. Here's what it says. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Let me tell you that if I were... uh, a preacher who liked to draw gigantic crowds at whatever cost I would take this text and have a wonderful time I would say to you that there is no more law governing Christians I tell you that you can do anything you choose to do so long as you do it in the name of Jesus I would tell you that there is no law. I tell you that when Jesus died on the cross, he took the law and nailed it to his cross so you can toss it out. And I think too many people are of that mindset because we've come to a time now where people in the name of Jesus are doing everything they're big enough to do. And I suggest to you it's why so many people are confused because they can't tell what we're about claiming Jesus' name. So the the text sounds like it's saying that something got nailed to the cross. Something did get nailed to the cross. You got to follow me now because I'm trying to cut to the chase. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had conformed to a society that was not congruent, was not fitting well with what their God had taught them to do. In fact, when you hang around people too long and beholding the wrong models, you tend to get a little sloppy with your religion. There are people now who claim they love Jesus, but their concentration is somewhere else. So instead of reading the word of God, they are always looking at television. And I'm not mad at television. Breath of Life comes on television. So I'd like for you to look at Breath of Life. But there's a lot of stuff on television that doesn't really do a lot of good for your life. Eh? I got sick one time, had to stay home and watch that stuff. I got so that I had to turn the television off. You know, ran out of breath of life to watch and don't particularly like to look at myself on television. So I was really messed up. There's not a lot of great stuff on television. The comedies seem to be geared down to about the fifth grade level. You know, and then they got to make somebody else laugh to tell me when it's time to laugh. I know when to laugh if it's funny. <laughs> But television will change you because if you look at too much of it, you forget what God intends for you to do. I suggest to you that the problem is that somebody misread it. That the Israelites got into Egypt and forgot their God and their practices and the relationship that made them different. So when they came out, when God brought them out, and everybody gets excited about that moment when Moses stands before the Red Sea and God opens up a dry path through all of that water. And I know we've got scientists who say that it never happened. They say it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. And they say it wasn't deep. In fact, they say it was about like that. Anybody could have walked through it. And all I got to tell them is that if it was just that deep, how come Pharaoh's army got drowned in it? What they do? Lay down in it? (laughs) When God got his children out, he had to begin to teach them how to be his people again. So he gave them all kinds of laws. He gave them civil laws. Told them about what animals belong to you and you should keep yours and not steal others. Told you how to, to manage your own family. You should not covet somebody else's wife. And even if you did, you ought to get, get it straight and don't try to steal someone else's wife. It talked about health laws and all kinds of laws. But there was one kind of law that God gave to Moses to help them remember the awful nature of sin. Because in Egypt, they had forgotten. And so God says, here's what you must do. 
when you sin, blood must be shed. Not just any blood. But bring a lamb, an innocent lamb. Bring it to the priest. And its throat must be slit. That innocent animal whose eyes look at you while you take its life. Slit its throat and let its blood be shed because the shedding of that blood represents the shedding of Jesus' blood. And it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. There are people who think that sin is a game. It is not a game. What God had to teach his people was after they had left Egypt, that when you sin, you've got you've to have the shedding of blood. I have read the, the accounts of butchers who will kill any kind of animal but not a sheep because they say they can't stand to see the innocent eyes look at them while they kill it so they'll kill anything but a sheep God intended for that innocent look to be violated so that we would understand that when you sin a price has to be paid and I'm glad to to announce to remind most of us that the price was paid on Calvary when the innocent Lamb of God Jesus Christ went to the cross and those laws many laws If you didn't have a lamb, you could get a turtle dove. If you couldn't afford a turtle dove, you could get wheat and use that. But you had to bring some sacrifice to show you that when you sin, something's got to happen to take away your sin. But those laws lasted only until Jesus went to the cross. One of my favorite writers says that when Jesus went to the cross, and I know most of you have seen that movie. I finally rented it. An amazing piece of film, but it sometimes misses meaning because it wasn't just suffering the fact is that when jesus the holy son of god gave what man could not take you got to remember that all of that suffering was not punishment that he could not resist he could have called ten thousand angels but he gave his blood because his blood stopped the need for animals blood and when Jesus died the writer who I love says that the priest was down at the tabernacle about to take the life of another lamb but when Jesus declared it is finished in heaven they heard it is accomplished it is done so no longer did animals need to die the priest's hand began to shake the knife dropped from his hand the lamb scampered and ran away because that that blood was not needed Jesus had died and so the ceremonial laws were nailed to the cross but I want to tell you tonight that God's law of liberty we just read it the perfect law of liberty still exists And I'm glad it exists because even in the presence of the law, there are a lot of people who don't keep it. What would happen if God tossed it? What would happen tonight if God said, just kind of do what you like? I saw a car in the parking lot already tonight. I kind of like it could tell you what it is but the guy might go out there and check tonight I can't take that car just because I like it because the law of God says thou shalt not steal do you see it what would happen if God tossed out the law well let me show you the difference in fact I got to do this fairly quickly but Exodus chapter 31 Exodus chapter 31 will show you that there were laws In fact, they are known as the Ten Commandments. Those laws were different than the ordinances. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. Listen to what it says. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God now I uh, 
I know some of you have been really let down because you thought Charlton Heston was God. <laughs> Even as a kid, I kind of didn't buy into that. Because my God is able to say to Moses, bring me stone. Well, first ones God chose. Next ones he says, bring me some more. I don't want to write this on paper or leather or vellum. I want to write it in stone because it's everlasting. It lasts forever. And Jesus, with his finger, it would take me to get a jackhammer to make indentations in stone. But Jesus, with his finger, backwards in Hebrew. And the law is written in stone. It's not temporary. There's no eraser on a pencil. This is the finger of God writing law. Don't you ever forget that the, the Ten Commandments, and there's no question in your mind, you don't have to know religion to know that those tables of stone were the Ten Commandments, and God wrote them with his finger to last forever. Okay? Uh, go with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Just happens to be a couple of 31s here. Deuteronomy chapter 31. I'm cutting to the chase. That's the way I like it. Long time ago, people liked for preachers to play around. <laughs> now they want it to happen fast. Tell me what you're saying quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 24. These are those ordinances that were against us. Watch what it says. It says, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. So even from the beginning, even when God gave Moses the ordinances that would keep a nation in order, traveling through the wilderness, he already said from the top that they'll last for a while, but they'll be finished. Now, let's talk about how long the Ten Commandments last. Uh, Romans chapter 7. I told you to go over there if you don't want to find text, if you don't feel like doing it. Stick a finger or something in Romans. There'll be a few of them. Romans chapter 7. And let's read verse 12. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Do, do you know that most law in most countries is based on the law in the Word of God? And the cornerstone of law is the Ten Commandments? In fact, in old days when they were those real lawyers, you know, I'm not talking about these new lawyers that all look alike, cookie cutter lawyers. I'm talking about the lawyers who had personality. Remember those guys? And they, some of them had long white hair and some of them had different kinds of suits. And, and when they wanted to be really dramatic, they would go into the courtroom and say, Your Honor, I open the word of God. Well, now you can't do that. We've got funny rules. But the fact is that most law is based on the law that is in the word of God. And as long as that law stands, and the Bible says it's holy and just and good. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, how can I tell you how to find that? Well, by the time you figure out, I'll be gone. So if you know it, you got it. If you don't, he, this is Ecclesiastes chapter three, and look at verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Now let's go back to the problem. The problem is that people are claiming Jesus, but they don't look alike. It's way beyond choir robes. You begin to wonder, what does it mean to claim the name of Jesus? I, I meet people who, who have Jesus' name on their tongues all the time. I, I enjoy hearing it. I meet people who say, Jesus is the ruler of my life. But it's more than quoting a phrase. If you're going to be in Christ, if you're going to be in this family, and we read it the other night, Jesus wants you 
to be in the family. He came to seek and to save the lost, but he doesn't bring you in the family to act like you always did in his name. Because when you get in the family, you ought to behave differently. My mom and dad, though they were not wealthy or famous, always had my brother and I to think that there was something special about being a Pearson. Doesn't mean anything to you. I got no reaction from you when I said that. <laughs> but they would say it. My mom would tell us, look, when you go out on the street, my mom, when she clenched her teeth, it was an important sign. <laughs> that was not a regular utterance. When she didn't want this, you should listen to her. There were consequences if you did. She said, when you get out of this house, you remember that you, re you reflect on this family. Don't you hurt me here about you doing things out there that reflect badly on this family. Yeah. You're going to think my mom was a mean woman. <laughs> she had two boys and she had to kind of keep us on the straight and narrow. And we knew when she clenched her teeth, you had better listen to that. So when we got out, I said, hey man, if you see me doing something funny, tell me because mom is on the war path. Join us next time for more of Pastor Pearson's message entitled Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Outrageous. <laughs>Ever wonder if your life has meaning and purpose? If there was more to life than a sink full of suds? If God was really active in the details of your life? If there was greener grass over some other fence? If so, get this week's offer, Outrageous Grace by Dwight Nelson. Life is full of choices. You can ski off a mountain and find a hospital, or you can get Outrageous Grace and find out what God has in store for you. You can ride a mad bull and find a hospital, or you can get Outrageous Grace and find out how much God loves you. You can hang upside down like this for some reason and find a hospital or you can well you get the idea get the book and be prepared to jump for joy or at least get a case of happy toes the grace from god is free the book it's a five dollar donation got it good get it read it and discover how the god of the universe is absolutely relentless in his love for you absolutely grab a phone and make a free call 877-BOL-OFFER translation 877-265-6333 or write for the book and let the U.S. Postal Service carry it to Breath of Life P.O. Box 97192 Washington, D.C. 20077 What else is there to say? Outrageous! I'm done. Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Join us now as Pastor Pearson continues his message entitled Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Jesus wants you. To be in the family he came to seek and to save the lost but he doesn't bring you in the family to act like you always did in his name because when you get in the family you ought to behave differently my mom and dad though they were not wealthy or famous always had my brother and i to think that there was something special about being a pearson doesn't mean anything to you i got no reaction from you when i said that but they would say it. My mom would tell us, look, when you go out on the street, my mom, when she clenched her teeth, it was an important sign. <laughs> that was not a regular utterance. When she didn't want this, you should listen to her. There were consequences if you did. She said, when you get out of this house, you remember that you, re you reflect on this family. 
Don't you hate me here about you doing things out there that reflect badly on this family. You're going to think my mom was a mean woman. <laughs> she had two boys and she had to kind of keep us on the straight and narrow. And we knew when she clenched her teeth, you had better listen to that. So when we got out, I said, hey man, if you see me doing something funny, tell me because mom is on the war path. If my parents cared about what their children did in the street in their name, do you guess God cares? Do you guess God might get a little disturbed at some of the stuff we do in his name? In fact, I have met people. Sometimes when I go to the barbershop, shop, I'm almost ashamed to say who I am because I know it's going to start a controversy, you know. But I can't be. I'm proud of what I do, but I just know what's going to happen. I, so they finally get around to, excuse me, uh, sir, what do you do? Well, you know, it's, is that important? Physicians tell me they can't say what they do or else they'll have to give free advice and Psychiatrists can't say what they do or everybody runs from them morticians <laughs> But when I say what I do people always got some <laughs> yeah another one of you guys What they're saying is that we and when I say we I'm talking about religious leaders and religious people we have so misrepresented what God's family stands for that now it's hard to convince people that it's a good thing to be in God's family. But I'm telling you that without a mirror, we will never resemble each other. We'll re never resemble our father and there will always be confusion. Romans chapter 3. Let's go there and I've got to move now. This enemy. Have you seen the size of my clock? Has anybody noticed? Uh, when you get a chance, come up here. I will never be able to say I didn't know what time it was. Uh, the numbers on this clock are about a foot tall. <laughs> so they got me. Romans chapter 3. Let me stop talking to you and find my text. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Romans 3 verse 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Uh, have you ever had it happen? Park somewhere where there used to be a painted curb. And you come back and you got a ticket. And you are, what in the world is this? You know, you lose your composure. Like, look at that curb. No color on that curb might have been color one day but give me a ticket when there's no color on the curb you know and what you're angry about is that they got you for something that they didn't tell you about so if you don't tell me what the rules are you can't catch me you can't punish me and, and, and the Bible says that the law tells you what's right and tells you what's wrong and I don't know about you but I need to know that I need to know when I'm right and know when I'm wrong. Now, there's something about the law, however, that's kind of like a mirror. Uh, go to Romans chapter 8. We're doing Roman stuff now. Uh, isn't this amazing? Isn't it amazing how well you found that text? Romans chapter 8. And let's see. I need to start with verse 3. Here's what it says. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now uh, let's take this apart. I wish I could do the whole thing but I don't have time. The law is weak like a mirror is weak. When you look in the mirror and it says, you need a shower. You say, how does a mirror know you need a shower? It can't sense your aroma. But you are disheveled. i tell you what a mirror can tell you. You need to comb your hair. You know, you need to wash your face. When I wake up, I got to look at wrinkles that have 
developed overnight as I lay on my pillow. I'm going to be trying to pull them out, you know. Uh, when I was young, they came out instantly. Now they kind of hang around for a while. <laughs> but the mirror is weak like the law is weak, and I'll show you how. The mirror can tell you you need to do something, but the mirror can't do it. The law can tell you where you're wrong, but the Bible says the law can't do it. It's weak for that function. But then this, this thing is so powerful, the text is so powerful that it shows you that the law is weak for some things. But look, in, in the very first verse, verse 3, it says, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The law is not made to save. The law can't save. But until you have looked into the mirror of the law, you don't know you need to be saved because you might think you're okay. And, and the easiest kind of religion is to compare yourself with other folks who claim they're Christians. He you said, yeah, I'm better than he is. I'm not doing that stuff he does. I saw him outside. I saw this kind of stuff he does. He lives in my neighborhood. I know he's a horrible guy. I'm way better than he is, so I must be closer to Jesus. Well, it doesn't quite mean that. The fact is that until you find salvation through Christ, you cannot claim to be changed even after the mirror has talked to you. Uh, go to Romans chapter 5 and let's start with verse 8 because this is cut to the chase Bible. Romans chapter 5 and start with verse 8. It says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This one has got power. In fact, I declare this to be our experience the power moment. While I was an enemy of God, in fact, let's get real, before I was born, before I was a twinkle in my daddy's eye, Jesus said before the foundation of the world, when Walter goes wrong, not if Walter goes wrong, when he goes wrong, I will die for him. I would have said, if Walter straightens up, if Walter shows remorse, if he seems to be worth the sacrifice, I might think about dying for him. Jesus says, I'll die for him, though he doesn't deserve it. I'll even die for him while he's still in rebellion against me. In rebellion against my father, in rebellion against God's word, but I love him enough that I will die for him while he's yet in rebellion. Is that an experience the power moment? Let me tell you something. If God had waited for me to get straight before Jesus died for me, I would be in trouble tonight. But before I was born, the price had been paid. While I was born in rebellion, Jesus loved me so much that the price had been paid. And then the offer was made to me. And then the text says, getting near the end, that if that is so and I'm reconciled, then how much more shall I live with Christ living in me? Well, go to Galatians because uh, I'm looking at the clock. I can, I can cut to the chase with this one. Galatians, well, not easy to find. You know, this Bible has been very angry because I've been looking for my text to pop up on those wonderful screens. And I haven't flexed it. Galatians chapter 2. Got a text for you that's amazing. And look at verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, 
I love this stuff. Call this the second experience the power moment. I'm dead with Jesus. And the fact is that Jesus did not deserve to be crucified, but I did. So I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's get real. The law can't change me. I can't change myself. The fact is that the Bible declares that an Ethiopian, now this, this is some old stuff, and I'm going to have to work on this one because, you know, you start talking about dark skin, you get into my neighborhood. Because uh, I tell people all the time, my tan is just about perfect. The Bible says, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard change his spots? If a leopard can change his spots or any one of us in here change our skin, then you can also take away your own sin. But the fact is that with all the stuff you can use, and you know, I know there's some great stuff. Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23, if you want to find it, they got stuff you can rub on you now. I saw it the other night. I taped a show to try to find out what they did with a guy's skin. His skin was awful. And they took a laser and... But at the end of that process, I was so happy to know that my text is still powerful. Because this guy had terrible skin at the beginning. After he healed from the laser stuff, it was better. But I could still see his imperfections. And the doctor said... Uh, sir, as you can see, uh, this is not a perfect process. Don't you look much better? And I read this guy's mind. I, saw, I looked at his eyes. He's like, I spent all this money and I still got this stuff. I've been going through all this pain and healing and you told me I was going to look good and I still got it. I know it's not as bad as it was, but I paid you enough money to make it go away. But he didn't know there was a text in here that says, can't change your skin. <laughs> Yeah, I know somebody will write me a note and say, I had mine changed. Yeah, you keep on living. It'll go back to where it was. <laughs> Amazing thing about plastic surgery. You get it, you got to get it again. Skin remembers. The Bible says if you can change your skin or if a leopard can lose his spots, then you can make yourself holy. The law can't change you. You can't change you. But the news tonight that I bring to you is the good news of salvation. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friends of mine, it has been my joy to preach literally around the world. I haven't been to every country, but I've been to enough to know that God's power works everywhere. I told my wife a few months ago, we've got to start taking before and after pictures. Because you can't believe what happens to people when they give up trying to change themselves and let Jesus change them. You can try to be like the Pharisees. Very frustrating. You know, there are people who say, I've got an iron will. And I can tell you about your iron will, it's just about like the last diet you were on. I see a cake in there. I'm not even tempted. Made up my mind, no more cake. Going to bed, upstairs. In your pajamas. <laughs> Not gonna do it. Trim this stuff up. You ain't gonna see me after I get through. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare.
no calories in that. I got the willpower. I have an iron will. So I can even taste that wonderful top that was on that cake. And uh, it has no power over me. (laughs) Carry it in my hand. I have power over you. Wonder how many calories are in a really thin slice. I believe I got enough power to actually taste this slice. And not be overcome (laughs) by it. You know something? Maybe I can start this diet tomorrow. Here's, here's what I gotta show you. Can you get to Ephesians? <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost some of you. Forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. C- can you get to Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 3. And all I need is one verse in there. And here's what it says verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able. If I had all the time in the world, if that horrible clock were not facing me down, I could, I could preach a sermon on now unto him. I'm not able even to resist cake, but he's able. In him I've got the power, because I'm not able, but he's able. And the Apostle Paul says, I am dead with Christ, but yet I live. But it's not me living. It's Jesus living inside of me. And I tell you that when you give Jesus the right to be on the throne in your life, he will give you power to overcome. Is there anybody who knows it's true? I have met people with horrible habits. I've met people with terrible addictions. And they've told me, I met a man who was on crack cocaine. I don't know what it's like to be on crack cocaine. I do know, however, that not many people can overcome it. And this man said to me, he said, Pastor, I can tell you that it's the most powerful thing I have ever confronted. He said, it's so powerful that it made me forget about heroin. Well, I don't know about heroin either, so I still don't know what he's talking about. I got some stuff in my life that's powerful, but here's what this man said. He said, Pastor, I started on crack cocaine. That's not a habit. That's an addiction. And it's a powerful addiction. It's not to be toyed with. There may be some people who will need to come to Christ and still get someone with clinical skills to help you. Whatever it takes, you ought to get it. But I'm telling you that until you have the power of Jesus. Well, let's read what it says here. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh within us. So here's what I want to tell you tonight. The law has not been done away with. Tonight there is a law. There is a mirror. If you go home and read through your Bible, your Bible will tell you when you're right. Tell you when you're wrong. But when you finish looking in the mirror, the mirror won't change you. You can't change you. But I know somebody who can. And he says, 
I'm able to help you above what you're gonna ask above what you can think one scholar says that means above what you can imagine he's able to do it with the power that he puts inside of you so tonight my experience the power moment is this when I can't he can't when I'm about to give up in fact one night I was preaching a sermon and I do believe that God spoke to me God speaks to me many times in many ways but I don't claim superficial holiness and and it's a beautiful thing when I hear God speak I'm preaching and God says mention suicide well you know God and I have conversations sometimes sometimes you'll say say stuff and I'll say Lord That's not going to make me popular. People are going to think I'm a little off key. But I've learned that when he says it, just do it. And so that night I said, in a congregation not unlike this one, if you've got a problem, if you've got a habit, if you've got an addiction that you can't handle, if you've tried everything that you know and you still got the problem if you're finished if you're through if you have no more resources if you can't do any more then why don't you give it to Jesus he says I can give you more than you can ask or even imagine and I will put my power in you you can go ahead and let yourself die so that suicide is no longer an issue in fact if you think your life is worthless tonight don't throw it away put it in Jesus hands if you do everything you can let him have a try at it what could it hurt if you're finished let him start because Jesus says you can die but I will come and live inside of And the things you couldn't do before, you'll be able to do now. But you'll recognize it's not you. It's Jesus moving in you. So I have met people who have overcome amazing things. In fact, I was about to tell you about those before and after pictures. I got to tell about this lady one more time. I wish you could meet her, but then you'd know the whole story related to her. I met a lady one night in an evangelistic meeting. That's one of these things. And this lady obviously had a job that was unacceptable in polite society. She apparently was a social worker. She had barely enough clothes on to be street legal. And since every preacher worth his salt knows that you folks kind of look at our eyes to see what we're looking at, I said, I can't look at her. So I looked above her scalp. And I said, yes, what can I do to help you? And she said, sir, I'm tired of the way I live. And you talked tonight about Jesus and his power. So here's what I want to do. Would you introduce me to Jesus? And I didn't care what anybody thought anymore about my eyes. I looked her straight in the eye and said, Jesus can cure any situation that you have. All you got to do is let him in your life. And that night before that woman walked away, we prayed together. And guess what? Nobody ever talked to her about her clothes. But the next night she came, more clothes on. The next night, and the next night, and the next night, she didn't walk the same way she walked the first time I saw her. And then I discovered that this woman had allowed Jesus to take over her life. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Now, rage!
Jess. <laughs> Ever wonder if your life has meaning and purpose? If there was more to life than a sink full of suds? If God was really active in the details of your life? If there was greener grass over some other fence? If so, get this week's offer, Outrageous Grace, by Dwight Nelson. Life is full of choices. You can ski off a mountain and find a hospital, or you can get Outrageous Grace and find out what God has in store for you. You can ride a mad bull and find a hospital, or you can get Outrageous Grace and find out how much God loves you. You can hang upside down like this for some reason and find a hospital or you can well you get the idea get the book and be prepared to jump for joy or at least get a case of happy toes the grace from god is free the book it's a five dollar donation got it good get it read it and discover how the god of the universe is absolutely relentless in his love for you absolutely grab a phone and make a free call 877-BOL-OFFER translation 877-265-6333 or write for the book and let the U.S. Postal Service carry it to Breath of Life P.O. Box 97192 Washington, D.C. 20077 What else is there to say? Outrageous I'm done